Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start with some uh, very brief introductory remarks, and uh, this way we can start uh, on time at 8 o'clock with the first talk. Uh, again, good morning, everyone, and appreciate your coming uh, on Friday morning uh, to this session. Uh, the very short, uh, basically, summary of why this session is and, and how we thought about this is that there's more and more effort and emphasis uh, both on the scientific side and uh, on the media and public uh, stakeholders uh, on the Arctic region. And uh, there are some uh, new activities and uh, increasing activities in terms of understanding the Arctic uh, system both uh, from the observational side and the modeling side better move it forward and basically get some better predictive skill. So our idea was that uh, we would like to have some uh, overview of what's going on in terms of uh, Arctic, uh, in particular, uh, with emphasis on the modeling the Arctic system. And we have six talks, uh, invited talks, uh, all of them. Uh, one first talk is on the global climate modeling and its uh, representation of the Arctic system. Then we have uh, uh, three talks on the regional uh, Arctic modeling, and then we have uh, two additional talks one on the uh, land component of the Arctic system, and then uh, basically what new developments in terms of uh, where the future models might be going uh, with modeling the Arctic system. With that brief introduction, I wanted to introduce the first speaker, uh, Jennifer Kay from uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. And uh, uh, in terms of the logistics, uh, each speaker gets uh, 15 minutes for presentation, five minutes for uh, questions. If you run through your questions and you take all 20 minutes, there won't be any questions. And the red light and the yellow and the green uh, is a standard uh, uh, for this AGU meeting. Jennifer. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here at 8 a.m. on Friday. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the global modeling perspective, um, and in particular talking about processes that explain Arctic climate change and coupled climate models. So this is not a particularly new topic for those of you who have read the literature over the last 30 plus years. And in fact, early modeling studies now completed, you know, 30 plus years ago found enhanced Arctic warming in response to increased greenhouse gases. I would say the first study that did this with a fully coupled three-dimensional uh, climate model equivalent to the type that we run today was Manabi and Stouffer in 1980. And uh, here they have a plot. It's the zonal mean temperature response to a quadrupling of carbon dioxide. And so you see a lot of positives, especially near the surface, um, three degrees around the equator. And then up at 90 degrees north, you see nine, nine Kelvin. So this is Arctic amplification in a climate model run over 30 years ago. So what's happened since 1980 in the Arctic? Well, I would argue a lot. Um, first of all, what have we observed in the Arctic? This is not new news to people in this room, but it's kind of remarkable if you think about it from the perspective of Manabi and Stouffer in 1980. So we've had greater than global um, Arctic warming. So 1980 is, is that uh, orange line right there. And we've lost about half of the September sea ice extent. So if you uh, want to know whether or not climate models are useful for understanding the processes important for climate change, here's an example of a climate model 30 years ago that included many processes that's apparently useful for understanding climate change. But a lot has happened in the modeling world as well since Manabi and Stouffer in 1980. And climate models today um, include many more processes uh, than Manabi and Stouffer did, and they're run at higher resolution. So two examples of this are, um, the first one is clouds. Uh, the clouds in Manabi and Stouffer were prescribed monthly mean, zonally averaged features. And anyone who knows anything about uncertainties in climate modeling today knows that clouds play a big role in that and they actually interact with the system now. They're predicted and recently they, they form from aerosols. So things are, are really evolving rapidly in terms of the processes that are, that are incorporated in models. 
Um, models today are also run at much higher resolution. The Manabi and Stouffer paper was a four by five degree model. The nominal resolution for a lot of climate models today is maybe a degree. And uh, at NCAR, we had a 30-fold increase in our computing power from a new com supercomputer that came online in Wyoming this fall. And you better believe that one of the things that's going to happen is it's just going to be run at higher resolution. It's the best way to take advantage of the machine like that. So I think we, we have a trajectory that's towards higher resolution and more and more processes. So an example um, of a climate model, for those who aren't as familiar with um, the climate modeling world, um, is the community earth system model, which is, is developed in NCAR, but its core is very similar to the model uh, used by Manabi and Stouffer, which was developed at GFDL. And here I just have some statistics about this model. It's a very complex uh, machine. It's been developed by many people over, over decades. Um, one of the things um, that I find particularly remarkable about it is that it includes over 1.5 million lines of computer code. So this is a very different model than the model that I had developed in graduate school to look at serious cloud microphysics processes. That, that was about 1,000 lines long, and I, I knew every single line in that code, and I could play with it in a, in a different way than, than you play with a model that has 1.5 million lines of computer code. Kind of have to know the geography pretty well of that model to, to tinker with it. And there are people that do that, and I have done that myself. But I think for the, for the public, it's important to communicate that there are things that happen in this model that are as observed. And it's not because they're put into the model. It's not like we have an ENSO parameterization. So El Nino is an important uh, mode of coupled climate variability. Um, we don't have ENSO.F90. You know, we have all of the important processes that control ENSO, and it comes out of the model. Um, another one is the observed Arctic sea ice loss, which climate models often, um, you hear, they can't reproduce this process. Well, actually, climate models can reproduce this process. And one of the things that, um, that we've seen is that there's a lot of variability in our transient climate simulations over the 20th century. And so just to dispel a couple of, of myths about this, but also to be a little bit sober about the, the relationship that we have with these models. They're complex beasts. So um, for the rest of the talk, we have um, some polar bears <laughs> to help uh, keep us uh, on time and also to make sure that we really get at the questions that the conveners asked me to, to deal with, which were mostly process-related questions. So this polar bear is, is curious about the Arctic climate response in my CO2 doubling experiments. So these experiments are very similar to the experiments that Manabi and Stouffer did, except I'm just doubling CO2. So um, how did I do these experiments? Well, I have these um, balanced and stable 1850 control runs. So here just um, from t three different flavors um, of the, the NCAR climate model. Um, the first is a fully coupled model, so it includes a deep ocean. And the, the latter two here are slab ocean models, or SOMs, um, and those um, with different atmospheric components, um, CAM4 and CAM5. So here we just see the top of atmosphere imbalance, pretty stable, and the global surface temperature, a little bit of a difference between the slab ocean model and the fully coupled model, but also stable. So the question basically that the polar bear is curious about is, you know, what is the response to the CO2 doubling? So if you look at that in time, this is what happens as a function of model year. So um, first of all, you have, um, when you impose a CO2 doubling, you have a top of atmosphere imbalance, and that um, is uh, reduced through time as the system warms and radiates that heat back out to space. You can see that the slab ocean models come back into equilibrium, you know, after maybe 30, 40 years, whereas the fully coupled model takes longer, and that's just because of the time scale of the deep ocean. So these are the experiments that I'll focus on for the rest of this talk, and really looking at a time mean average of the response um, to a CO2 doubling. So in the Arctic, um, just like Manabi and Stouffer, um, we found warming and sea ice loss, and actually with the same sort of seasonal timing footprint that Manabi and Stouffer saw. So you see the sea ice loss in the late summer primarily, although it's happening year-round, it's largest then, and then the warming also happening year-round, but largest um, in the late fall and early winter. So this is not a new feature at all. This is just a, what is interesting here, though, is that there's some large differences um, between the amount of warming 
And in particular, you can see this is, these are these two slab ocean model experiments again. We see that there's a pretty large difference between using different atmospheric components, just highlighting that there are processes that are un 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 um, uncertain and they have to do with the magnitude of the response. So back to our polar bear. What processes explain what's going on in these experiments? So um, we did a big diagnosis of what processes were important. Um, we focused mostly on the differences between CAM4 and CAM5, and that's all included in a Journal of Climate paper. Um, and this is just a figure that summarizes the results from that paper. And it does so using um, feedback parameters, which um, just enable you to look at how strong uh, different processes are in terms of controlling top of atmosphere fluxes. Um, and we think that that is related then to how important those are to the climate response. So if we look at the total feedback parameter, well, it's negative, and that's good, because otherwise the system would continue to warm, which is not good. Um, we looked at northward heat transport. This was a, sort of a, a local feedback analysis, and uh, what we saw was that while there were changes in the northward heat transport, they tended to be small, and they didn't tend to explain the differences between these two models. So there's actually a decline in the amount of northward heat transport in CAM5. Uh, we looked at long wave feedbacks, um, and in general, you see good um, agreement in terms of uh, the sign of those feedbacks, but um, you see that actually the CAM5 feedbacks tend to be more negative. So if you want to explain why CAM5 is warming more than CAM4, that's, that's not going to work for you. So that really leaves you with, with short wave feedbacks. And in fact, the short wave feedbacks in CAM5 were about twice as strong as they were in CAM4. And if you try to partition that um, into different aspects of the shortwave feedback, you see that's because CAM5 had a weaker negative cloud feedback and a stronger positive surface albedo feedback. So really the question is, you know, who's guilty here? And I'll just summarize that here. Um, there's um, these less negative shortwave cloud feedbacks, the more positive surface albedo feedbacks. And then also this is something that, that isn't included in this one figure, but it's also a point from the paper is that we saw about a 10% difference in the CO2 forcing in CAM4 and CAM5, and there is a stronger um, forcing in CAM5. So that also contributes here. So my polar bear is getting a little frustrated. It's mon uh, Friday morning and I'm still rambling on and he doesn't have any sense of how, how relevant these um, predictions and these idealized experiments have to do with his, his future, what's going on in the Arctic right now. So that brings us um, to 21st century Arctic climate change experiments, and in particular the RCP 8.5 experiments. It's just part of the suite of um, experiments that are, are run internationally right now to try to assess future climate trajectories. And what we saw was actually that what we learned in the two times CO2 experiments also came out um, in these uh, 21st century experiments, namely that the model that used CAM5 warmed more than the model that used CAM4, both globally and in the Arctic. So here's just a time series of that. Um, and you can see, for example, this uh, cyan line here, which shows that the Arctic would go ice-free about 20 years earlier in the model with CAM5 than in the model that used CAM4. So this is an example of taking um, the information you learned from an ide idealized experiment and, and seeing if it's relevant for these transient climate experiments, which of course have many other things going on in them, but in this case, because RCP 8.5 is a strong greenhouse gas forcing experiment, we see some of the same feedbacks that were operating in our idealized experiments uh, happening in our transient climate change experience. So um, I've spent a lot of time um, diagnosing the feedbacks in, in two models, basically two flavors of the NCAR model. And um, this was actually really intellectually satisfying, right? Because I work at NCAR, I can write diagnostics, I can dig into the model, and if I don't have something, I, I can make sure I get it or try to get it. And uh, that really was, was satisfying to try to understand those two differences. But uh, so here we just have these two models, um, and I'm just plotting the 21st century Arctic warming versus the 21st century global warming. And I just want to take a, a quick quiz, because, you know, 
I'm sure you all have also been looking at the CMIP-5 <laughs> archive, and do you think that these two models span the range of what is in the CMIP-5 archive right now? So raise your hand if you think yes. So no one raised their hand for the record. And that was good, <laughs> because actually the spread is much larger in the CMIP-5 um, ensemble. And when we looked, um, I, I'm not going to show plots, but the processes that were explaining the differences between the two flavors of the NCAR model actually don't seem to hold up in terms of explaining the spread across the CMIP-5 ensemble. Maybe this isn't particularly surprising, right? I mean, models have different mean state biases. They have different um, ways of incorporating processes. But um, I guess I really want to discourage the sort of search for a single process that explains the inner model spread. I don't think that's a fruitful path forward. I think diving into individual models and really understanding the processes in them is what's going to help us understand what's controlling the trajectory of Arctic climate change. So with that, I get to the summary. Um, so first, um, I just want to say this because I think it's really important um, as we talk about how model trajectories and things are going into the future that, that we've learned a lot from climate models over the last 30 years and that models run over 30 years ago teach us a lot about the processes that are important. Um, recent climate modeling experiments um, that we've done show that the CO2 forcing, um, the amount of weak negative shortwave cloud feedbacks and strong positive surface albedo feedbacks um, are important for explaining differences in, in two flavors, basically, of the NCAR model. And finally, while these um, shortwave feedback differences um, appear to be quite important um, for explaining trajectories in CESM, they don't explain the larger um, CMIP-5 ensemble. And with that, I'll just leave you with some related publications. Um, in particular, I want to highlight these two um, by uh, Heist de Boer and Alexandra Jan, um, which really do uh, a job of um, evaluating the CESM and CCSM um, model and um, comparing them to observations, which is something I didn't have time to focus on in this talk, but I think is, is important. And there's a lot of um, good comparisons and interesting um, uh, biases in, reported in those papers, and I think some of the things may shock you, like, for example, we do a reasonable job of representing the CI sickness distribution. That's, that's a good thing in our model. And so um, I encourage you to take a look at those papers if you're interested in evaluation with observations. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, we have uh, a short amount of time for some questions. Could you comment on the role of internal variability in the models uh, explaining the CMIP-5 spread? Oh. Explaining the CMIP-5 spread, I guess internal variability does not explain all of the spread in CMIP-5. Um, but if you look at an individual model um, like CCSM4 and look, you know, at trends from 1979 to 2005, pretty long time period. A model run basically with the same physics, the same forcing, can either reproduce the observed sea ice loss or have close to no sea ice loss at all. And so that tells you internal variability is, is important. It's, it's a big player here. But there, there are other things that go on also to explain the spread in CMIP-5, that, that model biases, the ice thickness distributions, the mean state in all these models can be quite different. So. So I'll repeat the question. It's a question about ocean circulation and that there's been a lot of observations of, of changes in the circulation. And um, the, the, the question was how well models are doing in reproducing those. Um, I would say the Arctic Ocean, um, we, <laughs> Alex's paper does do some evaluation of the ocean in CCSM4. And I guess I would refer you to that if you're curious as to what the kinds of comparisons and evaluations that we do are. Um, I know that there, 
our issues um, with it. And maybe, maybe I'll just leave it at that and, and talk to you offline. One more question. Yeah, so the question was about the importance of aerosols. And um, I would say aerosols, there's something that, that's really evolving quickly in terms of their representation in models. And so I think with that comes um, a lot of uncertainty in terms of their importance. Um, clearly, aerosols form clouds, <laughs> which have a huge impact on the Arctic climate system. And so I think you know the degree to which um, they're important, I think, is, is still very much under investigation. OK, I'd like you to ask you to join with me in thanking Jennifer once more. Thank you Thank very you. much. <clears throat>
internal variability, so this is due to um, difference between different ensemble members, and we see large amplitudes at the outer ice edge, so this is for uh, sea ice thickness. Look at the external variability, is that part of the variability to which is driven by by changes in the in the um, by temporal variability of the large scale forcing at the outer boundaries of the model domain coming in from the outside. If you now want to know which one is dominating, we can uh, look at the ratio. This is uh, external divided by internal, so external divided by internal. We also could call this for signal to noise ratio. And we see that all, all red and yellow areas have a dominance of the variability generated from outside, not in the Arctic itself. While the blue and uh, kind of green areas have a dominance of the internally generated variability. So we can see, we see that uh, there are areas where both of them dominate. Also, the, say the Arctic internal variability is dominating in areas where actually variability is small and ice is relatively, or ice is relatively thin. But um, after all, both externally driven variability and also internally generated variability play a role in the Arctic. It was one study over this. Now we are going to uh, downscaling from the GCM to the regional coupled climate model. It's the uh, lateral boundaries. We, we prescribe results from the GCM. In this case, the GCM, it's uh, two, different, two different GCMs was, uh, from the time before we had an own GCM, so it's two different external GCMs. And we show the surface air temperature, T2 meters, over time from 1960 to 2080. The observations in black, or it's a reanalysis in black, so it's the annual mean two meter air temperature average over the entire model domain. And we uh, find that the global models here, one version in blue, the other one in red, they're underestimating temperature, they're too cold. And when we're doing the downscaling here, for example, from the blue to the uh, magenta one, the magenta one is a regional downscaling of the blue global model, it gets a bit warmer. We are doing the downscaling from the GCM2, from the red GCM here, we end up um, with the green and brown regional simulation. And in both cases, the regional model is uh, lifting the temperature a bit. In this case, it's getting more real, actually. So we can, so based on that, we could figure that um, at least potentially the regional model can improve the global model's performance. The regional model has the potential to be better, simply spoken. But uh, this is, it's a potential. It, it's, it, um, it needs work to, to make it real. In, but in principle, you have higher resolution, which gives you better po possibilities to, to uh, represent circulation patterns uh, due to orographic features. And you have the possibility to uh, adjust physical parameterizations to the local conditions which you maybe cannot do in the same way in the global models, where you have uh, sand deserts and ice deserts in the same model. You, uh, in the, if you work on the regional domain, regional domain you are better able to, um, to adjust physical parameterization. So at least in, potentially the regional model can be better here. Next one. Uh, an interesting feature here is using the downscaling that uh, we have uh, increased variability in the sea ice extent. This is Arctic summer sea ice extent. The blue one is for a global model. Black is uh, reanalysis and the different uh, colored dots here represent four different regional scenario experiments which have, um, at first they started at a more realistic level and they show stronger distinctly stronger variability compared to the GCM. You see these um, various drops where sea ice summer extent decreases from year to year, or within two years, or within three years in some cases, quite dramatically, but then recovers afterwards. 
So we're looking into those events all together in um, several of those runs. We are able to identify 30 of such events, and we are doing analysis on those. So this is a composite of the most strong ice reduction events. So out of 30 events, we group together um, the strongest six, and um, then we look at the winter before the event in the upper panel and the summer of the event in the lower panel, and we show anomalies here, anomalies compared to a 10-year reference period before those events. We see that the typical winter before the event features uh, increased temperatures over, the, over large parts of the Arctic, especially in the, um, in the eastern part of the Arctic and in the central Arctic with um, maxima here in the uh, Tukchi Sea and Eastern Siberian Sea, and also a little bit here in the north of, of, of Kara Sea. And then if you go to the summer anomalies for sea ice um, concentration, we see that it's, that it's exactly, not exactly, but it's roughly the same areas which then have the uh, sea ice minimum. So remember, this is the, uh, a composite of, out of six different events. So the single event might have um, a minimum only here on the one hand side or on the other hand side, or in some cases I even have both of them. But the more we go forward in time, we can we see also events where, which which are ice free, where the uh, ice free areas are north of Greenland, and some ice is left in other areas. Um, back to the winter before the event, this uh, ice, this is the temperature anomalies, air temperature over the ice anomalies are um, partly reflecting ice thickness anomalies. We have uh, ice thickness anomaly here and a little bit even even there. But the pattern is also supported by, advection, by anomalous advection. We have this uh, high pressure anomaly here over Alaska, which is bringing in warm and humid air from the Pacific part. Then we also look to, need to look at the actual SLP. So on the left-hand side, we had um, anomalies compared to the 10-year reference period before. On the right-hand side, we now have actual SLP. Here the, uh, for the reference period and here for the uh, specific season. And in general, we see that uh, we have a reduced zonality compared to the reference season. I think you have a strong uh, high pressure anomaly above or high here, which is clearly reduced here. The same is the case in the, in the summer. We have a high pressure here and a reduced um, high pressure there. We also can see that uh, the uh, Iceland low is elongated further north, which could bring some uh, air of southern origin further northwards. So uh, summarizing this composite, so strongest ice loss events um, are, on, are on average connected to, to distinct winter anomalies in sea ice thickness and T2 meter. There's enhanced southerly inflow, and there's uh, less zonality both in, in winter and summer. Starting from a winter with already thin ice in parts of the Arctic, the summer sea ice concentration anomaly develops at locations very close at least roughly close to the, um, to the winter warming locations. Okay, now I have three minutes left or five minutes left? Three minutes. Three, three minutes. And then five minutes for questions. Okay. So we're looking at specific cases also. And I also want to point you at this example. This is uh, not the winter before, it's, it's, it's the spring. Before the spring, before the event, so one year and three months before the actual summer event, we have a circulation situation which uh, presses ice away from the Alaska coast towards the Russian coast, coast, which leads to an ice opening of Alaska, which then during the following summer can uh, re results into this uh, open ice area here. And uh, it's also reflected in the, in the thickness. This is then in, in, um, in a sea ice anomaly which survives the coming year until the uh, final event, which we have the final event, um, this is the, the summer of the event, which then um, has, has the CS anomaly left here from the previous winter and, um, yeah, from the previous winter. So preconditioning is important and an additional local anomaly popped up here, which is uh, purely driven by, by the summer. We also find this supported by um, by uh, long wave net radiation, which uh, helps generating those 
anomalies than during the actual summer. But precondition, it's preconditioned during the year before, mostly during the winter before. And then there's uh, local radiation conditions which make those events. Okay, uh, vegetation. We also have a vegetation part in this system model. Here we have um, a vegetation model LPJ guess, which is then um, uh, used uh, forced by observations, so by observed, at by observed atmospheric conditions, and we get a certain distribution of, of vegetation. Blue is forest and uh, yellow, orange is shrub areas. This is then uh, the same experiment has then been repeated based on a simulated atmosphere. And the results are astonishingly similar. The vegetation patterns are quite similar. We then go to, to the future, we use the regional climate scenario. Then we get a change and we see that uh, just uh, forest increases or parts of the uh, leaf tree forest increases and uh, shrub areas reduce. So it has an impact on the albedo also. This is albedo change due to that because different kinds of vegetation have different surface albedo. And this can uh, reduce by up to 0.05. And the next version of the model then this will be interactively coupled, which is not the case here. Uh, it also has an vegetation changes also have impacts on uh, sources and things of greenhouse gases and on uh, permafrost. We see permafrost changes here. The red areas in recent climate, um, maybe 10, 20 meters thick um, active layer, which almost disappeared when we get down to uh, one meter of the active layer and it also has impacts on the, on the, on the uh, sources and things of greenhouse gas. You can make um, calculations there. For example, uh, methane is uh, freed increasingly, and, uh, but due to the change in the vegetation, carbon uptake is increased actually. Um, down. Cordex. So we did a lot. Of, we did a lot of those uh, cordex runs, standard atmosphere only runs, downscaling of various GCMs, and uh, this is just uh, the last slide on very first results, very fresh from from last week. So the blue line is um, T2 meter atmospheric temperature. I think north of 70, 70 north probably. Uh, the blue is from is the ensemble from, of the global model. The red is the ensemble from the regional interpretation of the global model. And again, here we have the pattern that the regional model is somewhat warmer than the global model, which in many cases makes it better, actually, but uh, not in spring. The uh, reality is the, the black again. So we need to look into this. And uh, we also see this as a tool to, uh, to, to understand the mechanisms better by looking into the Ensemble, so we might, might be able to identify specific uh, ensemble members which are better or worse, and we can find out what, what is special in those ensemble members, and we can look into the processes responsible for the differences. Okay, spectral, my time is out, uh, but we also did spectral nudging, and it has a good effect on uh, sea level pressure. And I'll leave you with the summary. Thanks. There is some time for questions. Um, I see you showed the patterns of internally and externally generated variability, mm. and I wonder why they were so similar. Do you have any explanation? Could it have to do with, with the nudging procedure you are applying? Since normally you should expect over the Arctic Ocean a different internally generated variability pattern compared to the external drivers. Mm. What I showed was the uh, variability of sea ice thickness, and uh, the strongest variability was at the, the uh, outer margins of the sea ice, where it's relatively thin. So I guess that's the reason why both internal and external variability are strongest there. You can also look, we also looked at, uh, at uh, other quantities like uh, atmospheric air temperature, and then the pattern is slightly different. Have any more questions for Ralph? Yeah. I uh, mentioned that. Uh, sorry, yeah, the, the question was, uh, what is the reason why regional models are warmer than than the global models? Uh, this is certainly a specific feature of this model, and it, uh, uh, we don't know for sure. But I, I guess it's uh, something in the physical parameterizations. 
there's definitely the, the regional model is is um, in principle capable of, of uh, better resolving the response of the atmospheric circulation to orography that might contribute. But then we are better able to to, uh, to adjust the physical parameterizations to local conditions. So I do, do not say that regional models are better than global models, but potentially they can be better. And in this case, um, they, are, they are warmer. I don't know the specific reasons, but uh, I guess it's some, something in the, in the formulation of the soil scheme or radiation um, parameterizations. Any more questions? Okay, I'd like to ask you to thank Ralph with me. Our next speaker is Bill Gutowski from Iowa State University. He'll be talking on successes, challenges, and opportunities in the regional Arctic system model. Yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about uh, our project, which is uh, a large group project uh, originally involving four institutions, now seven institutions. Uh, Wiesla Maslowski uh, is the lead PI on this project, and all the other named people are also uh, PIs on the project. And over the span of about five years since we started working on this, we've had uh, a large number of uh, research scientists, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduates um, working on this project in various ways. This project is primarily supported by uh, the U.S. Department of Energy through the Earth System Modeling Program, but we've also had additional support from National Science Foundation. Uh, this is the basic outline of what I want to uh, talk about today. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, I'll be showing you representative examples of uh, some of our results in, in places where we think that our capability gives us a chance to improve over what GCMs uh, can do, um, but hopefully they're enough to convince you that we are on the right track. Uh, why do we want to have a, a regional Arctic climate system model? Um, Part of the motivation, especially when we got started, is that there are large differences from observations in global climate system models, uh, and there's simulations of the Arctic climate system. Some of this is perhaps not too surprising. A global model is trying to simulate the entire globe, and the Arctic is one small portion of area almost at the tail end uh, of the planet. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there are challenges that, that really are very small scale, which are difficult for global models uh, to achieve. Um, there have been various uh, regional standalone models, and by that I mean typically land atmosphere models simulating the Arctic, um, but then they end up missing important uh, atmosphere ocean feedbacks, air sea interactions, uh, because typically they have had a specified ocean and sea ice cover, although we've already seen some talks where people are moving beyond that. Uh, and as everybody in this audience, I'm sure, understands, um, the Arctic climate system has uh, seen very rapid changes in climate, some of the largest changes on the planet in, in recent decades with the sea ice decline. Uh, Greenland ice sheet changes are, of course, a major uh, uh, area of concern with their contribution to sea level rise and, of course, the large temperature changes that uh, Jennifer showed clearly in her first talk uh, this morning. Um, and, of course, I, as I think everybody in this audience understands, the Arctic uh, the changes in the Arctic have global consequences. It can alter the global energy balance through the ice albedo feedback uh, and also through influences on the thermohaline circulation, which again has global consequences. Uh, these points were, were, were made in a, in a report uh, listed here at the bottom by Andrew Roberts and others um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but they actually were part of our motivation as we started developing this project about five or so years ago. Andrew's document quite nicely summarizes and gives more detail on these motivations. So the rationale that we have for developing our regional Arctic system model, or RASM, is that we want to have a model that, that uh, will facilitate focused studies on the Arctic regional climate. And in particular, by having a, a regional focus, we want to be able to resolve uh, better critical details of, as I list here, land elevation, coastlines, ocean bottom bathymetry, not so much just for, the, for re improved resolution, but also because of the processes that are linked um, to finer resolution. Issues of, uh, say, with land elevation, uh, drainage flows, catabatic winds, ocean bottom bathymetry, issues of, of small-scale circulations that, uh, as Wiesla has shown in some of his work over the years, uh, potentially have a strong influence on how sea ice evolves in the Arctic. 
So going along with that then, it would be improved representation of local physical processes um, and feedbacks. Again, uh, some of the key aspects of this are related to how sea ice evolves uh, in the Arctic. And our goal in all this is ideally is to minimize uncertainties and improve predictions of climate change in the Pan-Arctic region. To do that, we feel we've needed to develop this, this full system model, which started out with uh, being basically atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, and land hydrology, and now is being extended to include land ice and dynamic vegetation, and as I'll show you in a moment, uh, has great potential for being able to expand well beyond that uh, with additional uh, processes. So the structure of our model is shown here. Um, this shows the basic core components. When we started out with this, we wanted to basically work with what you might call off-the-shelf components for each of our major uh, parts of the Arctic system so that we had models that were already, uh, in some sense, tested and true uh, in terms of uh, at least as standalone models working fairly well in, in the Arctic uh, so that we could focus initially on the, the issues of coupling these all together. Uh, so what we have here is the, the weather research forecast model for the atmosphere, the, the VIC land uh, model, uh, and then uh, really these are sort of work together, the, the, the POP and sea ice, ocean and sea ice models. Running initially at these resolutions uh, listed here, which are sort of uh, baseline resolutions, uh, we've already done some experimentation uh, with finer resolution, uh, especially uh, offline simulations, but also we have the great potential uh, and plans to go to much higher resolution with all of these. Key part of this is that they're all linked together through this flux coupler, and we purposely chose to work with the NCAR Community Climate System Models uh, flux coupler, um, partly because it was uh, an already uh, tested um, uh, code, but also because we are trying to make sure that our work fits into the, um, the, the NCAR's Community Earth System uh, uh, program, if you will, uh, and so we've worked closely with computational scientists at NCAR to make sure that what we develop here is compatible with uh, their protocols. And again, part of this is so that we can have uh, the ability to extend this model further beyond what I'm showing you this morning um, and to make it fit nicely with the NCAR's overall development, especially in the Arctic, so that uh, modules can be exchanged readily between our model and the global model, and they can be used to test in finer resolution situations as well as global situations. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show you today is going to focus on this initial development. That is not a typo. We originally called our model Rackham for Regional Arctic Climate Model, um, and that really is our initial core, although we are now extending beyond that to become more of an Earth system model. Uh, the domain is as shown here. Um, our, this is somewhat larger than some of the regional domains you've seen already. Uh, part of that is because we want to include not only all of the sea area with uh, sea ice variability, but also uh, to include uh, the major watersheds that are feeding into the Arctic to capture some of that interaction between fresh water flow into the region and evolution of ice and, and hence the climate. Uh, there's also different domains because of the different baseline models that contributed or that are part of this uh, and the, the way their grids are set up. So uh, here where we see the ocean bathymetry, that basically gives you the outline of our um, dynamical ocean sea ice model. Uh, the topography shown over land gives you the outline of our atmospheric model, which because of its projection is not exactly synonymous with the oceans grid, and for that reason we also have this extended ocean area where we simply uh, specify uh, ocean properties from uh, an observ observational climatology. Um, and this here shows that we are encompassing almost all of the Arctic system as defined in that Roberts et al. report, and in particular getting the major river water, uh, watersheds that feed into the Arctic Ocean. Some of our simulation results. This first here shows uh, on the uh, surface temperature from the era interim reanalysis uh, and the bias in, one of, in our simulations for winter DJF in summer, June, July, and August. Um, this is uh, from a, uh, one rendition of our model. We're still doing some tweaking in terms of how we specify certain snow albedo albedos, uh, features like that, vegetation, but nonetheless, this is a pretty representative result. Uh, this is summer over on this side here. This is bias with respect to the ear or interim uh, two-meter air temperature, and this is uh, the model's bias in a multi-year average compared 
again, to the winter uh, year interim values. Uh, the summer, the values are, are, are generally very low, uh, relatively large bias here in an area that's often a, a challenge for the models, but, but generally over most of the region, very low. Larger biases in the winter, the pattern of the biases is quite similar to biases that you see in CMIP3 and uh, more recent CMIP5 simulations. It's interesting to note this area of relatively large warm bias here, which shows up even more strongly in the CMIP5 simulations. Um, so overall, we appear to be doing, uh, getting lower biases in our simulations compared to the global models. We would hope that would be the case uh, for the most part. Um, it's also interesting to note that this appears to be a very challenging region to simulate uh, the temperatures for here in uh, eastern Siberia because uh, this is also an area where reanalyses uh, have relatively large differences in what they say the climatological temperature should be. And I don't want our model to be hiding uh, its problems behind uh, observational issues, but nonetheless, it points out the fact that this seems to be a challenging area to simulate well for reasons we still don't understand. But overall, um, our biases are relatively small compared to uh, the global models for this area. Um, this shows um, the contours here show our climatological um, uh, uh, mean sea level pressure. Uh, averaged over this 10-year period, and then the difference in the shaded contours from the era interim. And I want you to note in particular that the color scale is based uh, on a color scale that was used uh, in a study by, by Wiesla and colleagues uh, who evaluated CMIP-5 GCM sea level pressure differences versus the era interim. And to capture all of the range of variability or, or differences in the, in the GCM biases, they had to have this color range going uh, plus and minus 20 hectopascals here. We're using the same scale for this figure to point out that our mean sea level pressure differences in this fully coupled model are very small compared to the range encountered in the GCM. So again, we appear to be doing a, a very nice job in terms of simulating uh, aspects of the overall climatology, in this case, uh, circulation pattern. Um, some of the key internally simulated uh, quantities uh, are related to the cryosphere. Uh, this shows uh, the monthly mean uh, sea ice extent uh, for the northern hemisphere simulated in our model over this 10-year period compared to uh, SSMI um, values. Uh, you can see that uh, as the model settles down. We're doing, uh, I think, a very good job of capturing the uh, annual cycle of variability and to some extent some of the interannual variability as well, although we tend to overshoot the mark somewhat. Um, but we are capturing large parts of how the sea ice uh, evolves throughout its annual cycle as well as to some extent its inter interannual variability. Our simulations have recently gone uh, another 10 years and we have just barely started post-processing uh, that output. Uh, as I'm sure you're uh, curious to know, we, we are also curious to know just what happens to our sea ice as we go through um, the, the first decade of this century. Uh, the spatial extent uh, compares very well with uh, observations also. This is um, uh, the, the sea ice thickness and shaded contours, but uh, for comparison with observations, we have the outline here uh, of the sea ice extent uh, in magenta. Uh, given by SSMI observations for uh, March climatology over this 10-year period and September climatology over this 10-year period. And we generally are doing a pretty uh, good job, I think. Uh, you can spot some differences uh, in, in our ice extent versus the uh, observations. But generally, we are capturing not only the, the annual cycle and some of the interannual variability, um, but also uh, just where the ice is forming and uh, uh, melting. Uh, similarly, looking at snow extent, this is, uh, these are just three different uh, representative runs. Again, part of our trying to uh, calibrate the model more finely um, uh, compared to the NSIDC snow extent. And again, we, we tend to overshoot the mark going from year to year, but we are basically capturing the annual cycle. And I don't have time to show you here, but we're also capturing the spatial distribution of snow cover uh, uh, very nicely as we go uh, throughout the annual cycle. Um, I mentioned earlier that stream flow is an important part of what we are trying to capture here th through the coupled interaction with the uh, uh, salinity of the Arctic Ocean and the development of sea ice. This shows, uh, this is actually from a, a relatively simple starting point of how we supply discharge to the uh, oceans. 
Uh, but uh, a scatter diagram with observed stream flow on the x-axis and the racems stream flow as fed to the ocean uh, on the y-axis. And generally speaking, except for the Yenisei Basin, um, and these are two different uh, renditions of the model, we are generally capturing uh, the overall tendency of, of uh, stream flow uh, between different basins. And again, uh, doing a fairly representative job of the annual cycle, although um, if those of you want to talk with me later, we do have some problems with getting the seasonal cycle or annual cycle of the OBE, even though its overall annual discharge looks quite nice. Um, some examples of improvement. These are coming actually from offline studies, but they, they, they display characteristics that are present in the fully coupled model. They're offline because we wanted to compare with specific observed events. So one of the key things is that um, our model, um, our, our sea ice captures the inertial signal uh, that's present in observations. And what's shown here is a power spectrum. You may not be able to read it, but uh, uh, power spectrum, uh, amplitude of power at different uh, frequencies, where zero frequency is in the middle, and the inertial cycle shows up is this little shoulder bump here off on the side. Uh, there's an observational curve and a model curve. They're, they're, they agree fairly well for this Beaufort Sea region, um, September to December 2006, and then for the Nansen Basin uh, over the whole year. So we're capturing a type of uh, ice dynamics that occurs because of physics that are contained in our sea ice model, but also the fact that we're able to fully exploit those physics or more fully exploit those physics by the finer resolution that we're running at. Um, a key aspect of, of air-sea interaction is capturing uh, periods of very strong uh, atmospheric uh, wind flow. And an example here are these Greenland tip jets. Uh, this is from some work that John Cassano has done with his grad students. Um, there are different resolutions that have been used here, starting with the uh, era interim resolution and then some finer resolutions. This panel here shows results using in the wharf simulation for this particular date uh, at the 50 kilometer baseline resolution that our fully coupled model has. And then what you get is you go to finer resolutions and then uh, from this QuickScat satellite, uh, an estimate of the magnitude of the wind speeds given by the shaded contours and then the wind uh, vectors uh, also shown here. So as you go to finer resolution, you capture much more uh, clearly uh, the appropriate magnitude uh, of the, the wind speed uh, at the surface. And as I mentioned here on the side, uh, this is, of course, very important for capturing uh, ocean atmosphere coupling and getting uh, the strength of that coupling, especially in key regions uh, in the area where you have uh, lots of sea ice uh, formation and decay throughout the year and um, contributions to the uh, thermohaline circulation. So finally, to summarize and give you some sense of uh, further directions, um, what I've shown you here mostly has been results from our initial development of this, uh, what we called initially the Rackham model, focused on the ocean, ice, uh, atmosphere, and land. Uh, as I've mentioned, our performance is comparable to, comparable to perhaps even better than um, some of the, uh, a lot of the CMIP multi-model ensembles as well as individual models. And also, uh, we get improved representation of some key physical processes by virtue of um, our finer resolution, but also the, the physics that we're able to access uh, through having that finer resolution. Uh, we are extending this now into uh, the more fully developed RASM, uh, making it more of an Earth system model. Uh, so we're taking steps towards a uh, more complete Earth system model capability. A key aspect of that is we are coupling in the community ice sheet model. So we're able to start, uh, we're going to be working towards simulating, uh, in particular, Greenland uh, ice sheet dynamics. But also we're building in, you may not be able to see it clearly toward the back of the room, uh, modeling of glaciers um, and uh, dynamic vegetation and uh, more thorough modeling of river routing and river runoff. Uh, again, with the idea of developing this towards a more complete Earth system model. And then beyond that, uh, I want to emphasize that we are trying to develop this as a community Earth system model, and so there's opportunity for other people to join with us. We've already started exploring some other aspects uh, of this extension through uh, things that are already going on, trying to work with, with how fjords interact with uh, land ice. Uh, but also additional potential to include land and, and atmosphere biogeochemical cycles as well as in the ocean. And again, the goal here is to make this a community model that is accessible to uh, whoever wants to work with us or just take it and run on your own. 
with that, I'll say thank you and open it up for questions. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, the question was, was uh, about vertical resolution and the fact that uh, as it stands right now, it's, it's uh, relatively coarse. Um, as I said, we started off with the standard versions of these models. Um, we have clearly seen already, actually, that there's some aspects of where uh, vertical resolution and even uh, the vertical extent where the top of the atmospheric model is located is probably contributing to some model error. and. Uh, we, we clearly, obviously, as we go to finer spatial resolution, we need to also make sure we have commensurate vertical resolution. So it's, it's part of our further goal beyond just working with the starting component models. Um, and, and as I said, we've already seen that there's a, there's a need for that. Do you have any more questions for Bill? Okay, could you please join me again in thanking Bill? Thank you. Our next speaker this morning is uh, Stan Walschlager from Oak Ridge National Laboratory talking on improved climate prediction through a system level understanding of Arctic terrestrial ecosystems. Well, thank you. I appreciate the uh, invitation this morning to talk to you about a new project that we have underway in uh, Alaska. Uh, it is a large project involving four of the Department of Energy National Laboratories as well as the University of Alaska at uh, Fairbanks. Uh, it is also a new project. We have just now completed our first year uh, of field and laboratory and modeling studies uh, in support of uh, improved climate predictions and embracing a system perspective of Arctic terrestrial uh, ecosystems and their role in climate prediction. Certainly been emphasized more than once this morning that global models have improved over the recent decades, including additional inputs on land surface, atmosphere, and ocean processes, uh, and that those have led to improved uh, climate predictions. And this really speaks well, I think, of the communities that have come together to improve these models at regional uh, and global uh, scales. Uh, that is the field and laboratory scientists that are bringing new process level understanding uh, to the table as well as uh, the modeling community that has guided some of those measurements but also provided a means of incorporating that new knowledge into uh, our climate predictions. If you were at the Department of Energy's town hall meeting on Tuesday, you would have heard about the importance of identifying globally important and poorly understood ecosystems uh, and the fact that there are ecosystems that remain poorly uh, represented in Earth system models. Uh, tropical uh, ecosystems are an example. Uh, and in the context of today's presentations, the Arctic is also uh, one of those systems that at regional and global scales are inadequately represented and that if properly represented or improved representations made available could lead to uh, better predictions of climate. Certainly most of you are familiar with the many issues of Arctic ecosystems and positive and climate, uh, negative climate feedbacks. Uh, certainly there is a lot of land area uh, in the Arctic, uh, permafrost, that permafrost being rich in carbon and that with potential warming, uh, there are opportunities for that carbon to be released as CO2 and methane and a positive feedback to climate. There are, of course, a number of attributes of Arctic ecosystems that are important, both biogeochemical and biophysical, in terms of their feedbacks 
uh, to climate. Uh, today, I'd like to focus on just a couple of those, particularly as we begin looking uh, in our project at a systems level perspective of terrestrial ecosystems in the Arctic. Uh, looking at these systems as being very ice rich, they're very highly uh, complex to the point that the sensitivities of the Arctic are defined by very strong surface and subsurface interactions that occur across the physical, thermal, uh, and hydrologic properties of the system. And so we would like to be able to not only measure, but model a number of those processes. And that requires not only an understanding of those fundamental processes and properties, but also an appreciation for landscape dynamics and the strong surface subsurface interactions that take place. Uh, you can certainly see that there are ice lenses, ice wedges prevalent in Arctic systems and that with thawing we can get deformation uh, of the land surface in the formation of thermokarst and thermal erosion features. This is just a small subsidence uh, area outside of Prudhoe Bay you can see there the redistribution of water within these low areas, vegetation dynamics. You can envision CO2 and methane differences in that area compared to the surrounding tundra. On the Seward Peninsula, thermal erosion, difference in elevation between these thermal erosion features, preferential drainage networks in the surrounding tundra. And then a real strong motivation for our project is the transition from low-centered to high-centered polygons that could take place on the north slope of Alaska, the formation of preferential drainage network channels, uh, and a drying of the landscape, and then uh, cascade of consequences that that might have for biogeochemistry, biophysical feedbacks to climate vegetation dynamics. And so what we're calling the Next Generation Ecosystem Experiments Project, or NG Arctic, uh, is a project that has come out of a number of reports uh, from 2008 and 2010, uh, where we have been given a mandate to develop a process-rich land surface model for the Arctic that encompasses not only the processes that are important, but also this issue of uh, dynamic landscapes uh, such that we can represent both of those at high resolutions within uh, global Earth system models. Of course, one of the challenges that we have, and this relates back to my earlier comment about the Arctic being a very complex system, is just the challenge that we have of coupling all of the processes, the biological, geochemical, and landscape processes, in such a way that we can understand this emergence of system behavior uh, and representation of that in uh, models. Now, we are using the conceptual framework that Ted Schur and others have developed uh, and published in 2008, where we're looking at uh, biogeochemical and biophysical feedbacks to climate uh, with permafrost thaw and degradation across both oxic and anoxic environments, that is, upland and uh, lowland uh, tundra. Our overarching science question has to do with permafrost degradation and the associated changes that take place in landscape evolution, consequences of that land surface deformation to redistribution of water across the landscape, effects on biogeochemical processes, plant community accession, and the positive and negative feedbacks that those might have to the climate system. Now, we have a number of science areas that we are using to organize our team um, in terms of our field and laboratory measurements, uh, hydrology and geomorphology, biogeochemistry, vegetation dynamics, and then an integrated model data evaluation team. And all of this is wrapped around, if you will, modeling taking place at fine, intermediate, and climate scales. We've been fortunate to get our first year uh, off to a quick start by working in Barrow, Alaska, where we have access to the Barrow Environmental 
observatory. We've got good community support and good logistical support uh, as well in that area. We also have the ability to use a lot of information that has been collected in the barrel uh, area already. This is from a paper of Zuleta in 2011 in which the geomorphological features of this uh, Arctic coastal plain uh, have been characterized in terms of various ages of drained thaw lake basins, thaw lakes, and interstitial tundra. Uh, one of the things that we think is important for our project is to be able to relate our process measurements uh, on the ground to geomorphological features that we can then represent in our fine, intermediate, and climate scale modeling. And what this paper does not do is begin to identify low-centered and high-centered polygons. And so we've been fortunate in the first year to have access to uh, LIDAR imagery for uh, our field site, uh, thanks to Craig Twitty at the University of uh, Texas at El Paso. We can identify our field site, and then using a number of techniques, wavelet transformation, segment delineation, triangulation, we can actually move from that uh, LIDAR imagery to a definition of low-centered and high-centered polygons for our field site. So this begins to allow us to characterize that interstitial tundra, uh, if you will, much more uh, finely and relate to some of our process uh, information. And this is work that's being done at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We also have been able to identify uh, areas uh, within the Barrow Environmental Observatory, uh, low-centered and high-centered polygons, taking advantage of both transects uh, and uh, field areas, doing geophysical surveys across those areas, ground-penetrating radar and EM studies, and then being able to take that information and relate it to snow depths, thaw depth, other characteristics that we have determined on these areas using point measurements, and then using 3D geophysical tomography techniques, we're able to begin visualizing ice wedges that are present underneath these polygons and be able to represent their distribution across the landscape and the importance of those for uh, permafrost degradation. David Graham has been involved in our biogeochemistry team. We've had drill rigs out on the tundra beginning last spring. We're taking soil cores and then taking those back to the laboratory for controlled process level studies for CO2 and methane emissions, as well as microbial studies and geochemistry measurements to hope uh, in the hope of being able to relate all of those to uh, fluxes that we could then verify uh, in the field and incorporate into uh, our models. We've been doing hydrology measurements and installing water wells in the area, coming back in the field season and looking at water table depth, water levels, preferential flow paths within the area, surface water chemistry, near surface water chemistries as well, trying to understand all of those processes, and then use those in intermediate scale models to look at water movement across the landscape. This was an application of the river tools uh, program that Bob Bolton and Bob Busey did uh, as part of our project at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Uh, using the LIDAR imagery uh, and then ba uh, based on these uh, low elevational systems looking at preferential flow paths uh, across the landscape. And we're ultimately going to uh, want to use this information to design our network of monitoring sites for looking at hydrology, uh, but also to look at the hydraulic redistribution of water across these landscapes, determine connectivity uh, and then pass that information from our intermediate up to our climate scale models uh, as we uh, represent some of those processes at larger scales. A lot of vegetation dynamics work 
going on, vegetation harvests, below ground work, separating out the various species and the role of those ecosystem community composition to biogeochemistry and biophysical feedbacks, looking at below ground distribution of roots and their importance to soil carbon distribution, and then being able to represent those different plant functional types, both above and below ground, in our intermediate and climate scale models. We've also had good progress, uh, thanks to our colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory at taking measurements of CO2 and methane using static chambers across uh, our field plots, the low and high centered polygons. Also looking at NDVI and albedo measurements at plot scales. And then relating that to landscape scale measurements of CO2 and methane using eddy covariance techniques, as well as beginning to look at some of the radiation components uh, of the system as well. I just want to end by emphasizing that many of the measurements that we're taking in the field are guided by models. Uh, we hope to have this interaction between the modelers on our team and the field and laboratory scientists such that the various measurements that we take can contribute to models in the form of new parameters and algorithms, initialization data sets, evaluation data sets, and then of course leaving uh, the door open for plenty of discovery science. Uh, but obviously this places a priority on our modeling and measurement teams working closely together uh, and planning this experiment, uh, as well as integrating those two teams as we go forward uh, in both our upscaling and downscaling activities and the translation of information at plot up to climate scales. There are a lot of opportunities for uh, people to get involved in the NG project. I'll just let you take a look at some of those, but if you're interested, please come and see me or others that are involved in the NG Arctic project. We'd like to talk to you about what we're doing in Barrow and then what we could do to collaborate at other sites in Alaska and then ultimately uh, at Pan-Arctic scales. And with that, I'll just thank our sponsor, the Department of Energy, and if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer those or catch me afterwards. Thank you. We have time for some questions, if there are any. <clears throat> Stan, could you address how, uh, how this work could, uh, could relate or could feedback, could contribute to some of the uh, modeling activities that we've heard about earlier today? Well, certainly, the uh, some of the presentations, of, of course, that we heard today were on global climate and then regional climate. And all of those models uh, are, if you will, only as good as the data that go into parameterizing them. Uh, and we think that what we are beginning to emphasize through this next generation ecosystem experiment is a data collection and a process understanding uh, activity that can contribute new knowledge, new parameters, new initialization data sets uh, for uh, regional and, and global climate models. So I think there's a real natural handshake that takes place uh, between those communities. And I'm very uh, excited uh, to hear about the RASM work. And you can see the scale at which that model development is taking place, the processes that are being incorporated into that from vegetation dynamics and biogeochemistry. Uh, and I think our field study and our laboratory studies have a a direct connection to feeding into uh, that kind uh, of effort uh, and other efforts that we heard about uh, during this session. Yeah. Well, that's certainly going to be a so the, the question uh, was one of how we plan to move from process understanding up to uh, climate scale uh, predictions uh, through upscaling methods. And that's a, a, 
a science topic uh, in and of itself. It's very complicated, if you will. Uh, but we do have a number of fine, intermediate, and climate scale models uh, that we hope to develop and parameterize and transfer information from each of those scales up to what we will be using as CLM uh, at uh, the climate scale. I think that probably only answers, uh, be only begins to answer your question, but, but we can talk about that more. Okay, please uh, join me in thanking Stan once more. Our final talk today is by Dmitry Sidorenko from Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven. He'll be talking on uh, towards decadal climate prediction using model systems with regional refinement for the Arctic. Yeah, no? okay. Okay. okay, I I work together with all these nice people towards towards the establishment of a Earth system model where we basically couple two models, uh, ocean and atmosphere. And atmospheric model is ECOM uh, from Max Planck Institute and ocean component is finite element sea ice ocean model which supports unstructured measures, uh, measures and has been developed at RV. And uh, the major difference of this work to other existing developments is the ocean component which is used in the couple setup. And in this slide, I explained briefly why we may need another ocean component and illustrated here for the Arctic region, which is full of small scale features you know happening there. Like we know that Rossby radius of deformation reaches eight kilometers at the Siberian shelf. Uh, Polynius in the Laptev Sea, CAA, is full of narrow, narrow straits, uh, Bering Strait, overflows across Greenland, Scotland, Iceland, which are crucial for setting the strength of the meridional returning circulation. And all of these features should be accounted in a general circulation model if we want to have a representative picture of an Arctic circulation and study its impact onto climate system. And commonly, uh, climate models do have cost resolution also in these areas, meaning that uh, all the effects are parameterized, like uh, channels are made wider, topography deeper, mainly across the flow regions. This implies basically that the dynamic is rather poor, but the clear advantage is that these models are cheap, fast, and can be integrated for longer time scales and are, of course, of a great use. But if you want to resolve all these features in a global setting, you will have to pay the price because uh, dynamics will be, of course, rich, but the models will be, such models will be rather expensive and cannot be integrated for longer time scales. And therefore, another way to proceed is to use coarse global model and downscale the region of interest. This means that two models are running in parallel course, global, and fine, regional, and both exchange fluxes across the common boundaries. This is a cheap computational approach, but boundaries also need to be somehow treated. And overall, all the approaches have their pros and cons, and that's why we do follow an alternative one and use a model which is based on unstructured meshes and allows for variable resolution. And so here the advantage of variable resolution is uh, exemplified where the North Atlantic region has been refined to an eddy scales in the global setting. The resolution in the Arctic reaches four kilometers and uh, goes uh, to from 25 to 100 kilometers in the rest of the ocean. And this is an example sort of of an ideal nesting and uh, interestingly the structured uh, mesh based models would allow for the resolution of 30 kilometers if the same amount of surface nodes was used. And the advantage of uh, unstructured mesh approach is clear here. The resolution is defined by the size of a triangle and this uh, allows to refine the areas 
of particular interest and resolve narrow straits where it is needed. And at AVI, we do have a model which supports such a meshes. And uh, it has a name, finite element sea ice ocean model, or just FESOM. Uh, typical for any GCM, it solves hydrostatic primitive equations under Boussinesque approximation and has an integrated sea ice module. And on the other hand, we use a uh, finite element technique to discretize the equations in the model domain, which is split into triangles at the surface and prism or tetrahedrals in vertical. And this is a discretization technique which uh, allows for um, variable resolution and local refinement. And the effect from local refinement is illustrated here. Uh, left is the kinetic energy, right you see the temperature distribution at 300 meters depth. Upper panel corresponds to the reference run with the course resolution everywhere of about 25 or 24 kilometers. And the lower panel corresponds, corresponds shows the result when the, where the refinement was done. And you see that the kinetic activity is more pronounced along, along the Atlantic water path. And this in turn affects the mean temperature distribution. So compare these upper and lower panels. And the point from this slide is that this is a result from the global ocean simulation where only the Arctic region is shown, so no open boundaries are here. And another example I picked up from the work by Claudia, who compared FESM simulations with different resolutions over Canadian Arctic archipelago. And on the right, you see the course reference mesh, and on the left, you see the mesh where the refinement was done. Outside this area, both grids are nearly identical. And uh, Claudia computed the transports across uh, different uh, passages and compared them to the observation. And below, you see as an example the freshwater transport across Lancaster Sound, uh, time series of it. And the red curve uh, depicts, depicts the data, and this uh, light bluish line is a low resolution result. You see that the reference run, so this one, tends to underestimate the mean transport and its variability, while the refinement, so this, this, this bluish line does, does, oh, this dark blue line, sorry, does a lot of improvement. And the same message here as in the previous slides, this is a result from the ocean, global ocean simulation. Uh, no open boundaries are here, just CAA region is shown. And currently, FESM is uh, actually used in a lot of ongoing activities as a standalone ocean model. We also do GIS melting and other things. Our question in Taurus project, project is, however, to show how the climate uh, predictions can uh, benefit from the unstructured modeling, from the unstructured mesh approach. And for this purpose, we obviously do need a climate model and this, why, this is why FESM has been coupled to ECOM atmosphere. And the setup follows the standard practice where the bulk formulas are put to the uh, atmospheric part. This means uh, that uh, fluxes are computed uh, by ECOM and uh, FESM provides the surface fields and the coupling step has been achieved via the parallel Oasis 3 uh, MCT coupler. And I'm not going into details, just say that we have two, two configurations running, FESM coupled with ECOM 5. Uh, that's what we started from, and we have validated this setup for long time scales. And uh, FESM ECOM 6 we have coupled recently and uh, do not have longer than a decadal simulations yet. That's why all the results I show further are computed with ECM 5. And also currently we use uh, uh, meshes, uh, resolutions which are comparable with other climate models because we are still anyway in the validation phase. And here is an example of uh, 
our current configuration. So you see the surface meshes. Left is the FSM mesh. And on the right, you see the T63 ECOM atmosphere, only ocean covered areas shown. And uh, technical difficulty was to couple these two meshes, which have totally different geometry uh, uh, representation of coastlines lines and um, rules for flux definition. And the flux should be conserved in both components, no matter how you do interpolate. And it was no, not, not really easy and a lot of technical efforts we had to invest, but finally the system was run. And here you see the sea surface temperature after present day 700 years simulation. You see that the canonical pattern is preserved, like all the main giants are on places, but obviously we, we, explain, we expect some, some, some biases to, from the observation. So, and they are shown below. As, and computed as a difference uh, from World Ocean Atlas 2009 climatology. On the left, you see the SST bias. On the right, the SSS. Um, and the SST bias is a huge negative anomaly over subology indicates a problem which is common, very common for most of climate models and was addressed already in some papers in SkyFed all 2011. He showed that uh, it depends on the um, Atlantic winter blocking frequency and increase of resolution of Atlantic sector improves a lot. That's what we were planning to do, by, but, but haven't done yet. And uh, sea surface salinity bias indicates that we have to do something about hydrological module via lack of runoff and uh, surface salinity anomaly reaches sometimes 3 PSU over some bearing shelf. But despite being huge, I should say all these anomalies are within the spread uh, of the existing climate models with the same resolution. And obviously we do not look only at the surface fields. They, we know, do not, do not tell us much. We use other diagnostics. And concerning ocean, concerning ocean we primarily look at the oceanic transports. And in the upper picture you see the Global, global meridian of oceanic circulation uh, with a basin wide mid depth cell of about, of about uh, 14 sweater, 14 to 15 sweater, and the bottom cell is also well reproduced. And below you see the time series of its Atlantic maximum at 45 five north. Uh, it shows that model needs above 100 years to adjust to the initial conditions and we start from climatology here and this adjustment comes primarily comes primarily from from uh, from the ocean side and we also have rather intensified interdecadal variability we don't know whether it's good or not and as I say we do compare another um, diagnostics and overall the conclusion is that uh, FIASM being a model based on unstructured meshes can be coupled with a regular atmosphere and under moderate resolution the, result are, the results are within the spread of other existing climate models. And uh, the other question about the um, uh, assessment skills of such a setup and we also did other things like TIDA looked at the model sensitivity to to uh, the increased CO2 or change in sea ice albedo, but I think it will take more time to speak about this, so I will basically just jump to my uh, conclusion and say that, that uh, um, uh, these uh, models based on unstructured meshes, they do allow for a variable resolution and local refinement. And we have been demonstrating this FESM since uh, some years already, the benefit of it uh, in a standalone ocean system. And uh, such models can be coupled to the atmosphere. And uh, we tried it with ECOM FESM. And uh, under moderate resolutions, the results are within the spread of the most of existing climate models. 
and the benefit of the local requirement we still to validate. So hopefully next year. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, we have time for some questions, if there are any. Um, uh, um, okay, if I can speak about any problems, uh, yes, like any modeling, of course, we, we, we do have problems here, and as I say, I mentioned the technical difficulty of coupling, so it's not so easy and not so straightforward to couple unstructured meshes with regular um, meshes because, I mean, there are a lot of difficulties in flux formalism, how, how these things are uh, defined. Uh, overall, I should also say that uh, unstructured meshes are, of course, as, not as fast as uh, regular mesh models. So if you are going to, to use the same resolution everywhere globally, so I wouldn't go for it. So I would use a structured model because you, the f uh, slow factor is in between three or five or so. Uh, so depends on the problem. And um, also, due to unstructuredness, also the post-processing, I should say, it's not so easy. So we have also another models for post-processing the results. Like, like you saw, I plot the meridional weightonic circulation. Here, stream, so stream function. It's also not so easy to compute it because you don't have really a straight line, yeah, which, which is, uh, which is uh, zonally aligned. So you need to interpolate, and due to interpolation, you get uh, uh, some errors in the divergence, you need to correct for this, and so on. So there are, of course, difficulties, but there are also there is also a lot of gain. Uh, uh, some things, yes, but uh, you always need to find the ways out how to do it. Basically, whatever you can do with structured models, we can do here. The same parameterizations are used, so we have gem parameterizations, we, we have uh, all these things included and they're working, basically, so that's true. Maybe they're slower for some, some reasons, like, but, but they're working and they're implemented and have been tested already as well. Can you give a comment? Bossy, we try to uh, avoid uh, our experience in the legal set of anechoes and we talked before, and so driving the feedback that Set global model as well. So of course, we have to do some retuning of some different relations with respect to coming in every. Ah, this is Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. With that, I'd uh, like to thank all the uh, authors for uh, presenting very interesting topics and for uh, staying on time and uh, addressing the questions so nicely. I'd also like to. Uh, to thank the uh, co-conveners, Wiesla Maslowski, Andrew Roberts, and Klaus Detloff, and I'm Larry Hinsman. I uh, thank the, uh, the audience and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.